Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darren Milligan. I'm the uh, Vice President of Marketing for Avery Denison uh, in Asia Pacific. And today I'll be talking about pressure sensitive labels and uh, circular packaging. The agenda I'm going to go through today is to talk a little bit briefly about Avery Denison and our new 2030 sustainability goals. We'll walk through some of the key industry trends that we see across Asia, particularly as it relates to sustainability. And then we'll walk through our portfolio of products and solutions that we're working on and come to the end. For those of you who don't know us, we're a publicly listed company on the New York Stock Exchange in the Fortune 500. We turn over a bit over $7 billion. We have three operating divisions, industrial and healthcare materials, retail branding and information solutions, and the, the division that I work within, which is label and graphic materials. And within Asia Pacific, we basically uh, are in every single country. We're manufacturing product in China. We have two big manufacturing sites, Korea, Thailand, Malaysia, and in India, we have multiple sites. And our distribution footprint and our commercial teams are in basically every country across the whole region. Before we get started, it might be useful for us to just frame where Avery Denison sits in the value chain and remind people if they're not clear what our product looks like physically. So our value chain, we are buying and using paper and films for face stocks and liners. We're also bringing in silicons and adhesives and producing them in our plants. On the adhesive and film side, we are vertically integrated in certain categories as well. We bring it to our site. We actually coat these on big machines that range from one to two metres in width. And after we've coated them into large master rolls, we slip them down into smaller rolls, which allows us then to deliver those to our, our converters or our, our printer customers in narrow, shorter rolls. The printer would then do the label printing and die cutting and produce effectively labels in smaller rolls. Those smaller rolls are taken to a, an, what we call an end user or brand owner and applied to the container or the, or the product they want to apply the label to, and then ultimately comes through to the consumers who uh, buy a product with a label on it. When you look at our process, this is where the matrix is created. So the converters in the processing of a label will create a byproduct called matrix waste, and I'll address that later in the presentation. When we look at the basic label construction, you can see that, that every label stock has a so-called face stock, whether it's paper or film, sometimes has a top coat on top of that, but effectively it's the printable surface and it's what you would see as the face of the label. Underneath that is an adhesive. We have different technologies, but effectively a self-adhesive label is activated by putting pressure on the adhesive and that creates the, uh, the bond onto the, the substrate that's been applied. And then underneath that, you have a release liner. That release liner has typically a silicon release agent on it. And then you've got a, the liner itself, which is either paper or film. That liner both carries the label all the way through to the end user. It's also the basis for which die cutting is done against. So our sustainability goals were recently revised. We previously had eight goals. They're now compressed to three. Um, and I'll talk a, a, in quite a bit about the first one, which is delivering innovation that advances the circular economy. For us, that includes advancing technologies that enable recyclability, extend the lifespan of products, reduces waste, increases recycled content, and integrates opportunities for circular processes across our industry. And that's the main thrust of what I'm going to cover off today. The second one, reducing our environmental impact in operations and supply chain. We have a dialed up focus now on a greenhouse gas, increasing water efficiency, and protecting forests from deforestation. The third one is uh, about being a force for good, making a positive social impact by enhancing livelihood of people and communities. That's promoting safety, enhancing the employee experience, um, as well as investing in the communities that we sit within by uh, advancing uh, women's empowerment, sustainability and education. Let me talk about uh, four of our goals that have been uh, evolved in the 2030 uh, outlook. First one is 100% labelling for circularity of plastics. So what that means to us is that we have products available in every region that enable recyclability, compostability or reuse of consumer plastic packaging. And uh, part of that means that they're actually relevant in terms of availability and cost. So this is 
one of the key themes that I'll talk about in the coming slides. The second one is that 100% of our standard products will contain recycled or renewable content. Third one is that 100% of our paper is from certified sources. And as I mentioned, we have a big focus on making sure that we have a deforestation free future. And the last one, which I'll cover on later, is the liner and matrix waste that is a part of the processing of our product through the value chain. That 70% of our industry has at least has access to matrix and liner recycling, and they're driving a circular outcome. And you can see on this page, this is a summary that was done by AWA in 2019, that nearly 50% of the industry's line is still going to landfill and into incineration where there's no energy recovery. So that's for the whole of Asia. Uh, you see uh, at one end countries like Japan, more advanced, and other countries in Asia like India are less advanced. So that's an averaging. Uh, so there's, there's still work for us to do in this area. I want to spend a moment just giving some context on the Asia Pacific uh, labeling industry from a high level. You see in that first column there that uh, the industry itself, uh, over 30 billion square meters, predominantly dominated by PSL and glue applied. The growth rate for PSL or self-adhesive is at a stronger level than glue applied, which is an older technology. We also see sleeving coming up more and more, but it's very concentrated in the beverage industry. Of all the industry segments that we serve, the beverage segment is growing the fastest into the future. So self-adhesive is the largest uh, technology going forward. And with the evolution of things like e-commerce, we are also seeing more growth in that part of the industry where we have secondary labeling, which carries a barcode or information, which is typically um, on, on the outside of a box. Where I'm gonna focus on today is what we call primary labeling, which is on the primary package. And if you look at the middle column, you can see that for us, uh, of all the container types, uh, rigid plastics is the main one that we're we're applying to. Glass is another category that we play in, but the biggest one in Asia is rigid plastics, which is 25% of the mix. For most of the governments around the region, their their primary focus, however, is on flexible packaging, which is disproportionately large in Asia. There's a lot of single surf product out there in flexible packaging. It's nearly 50% of the entire category. A key point to make on this slide is when you look at where does the label fit in the overall scheme of things. Uh, you can see that diagram there shows that a label or the decoration of a, of a container is less than 1% of the total package weight and 94% of that uh, package weight is the actual primary container. So the vast majority of circularity outcomes should be focused on the 94%, which is the container itself. And that's why a a primary focus for us is how do we enable circularity of the container. We take responsibility for the label itself, but enabling circularity of the container is, is a bigger impact to the overall outcomes achieved in society. Asia itself is such a uh, complex and varied region. You move to a very mature countries like Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and then you have the evolving, maturing countries like China who are rapidly coming up. And then you have countries that are further back in their development, whether it's Indonesia or India. Across the whole region, you have this mix of emerging, maturing and mature countries in terms of the way they are thinking about sustainability. One common thread across all countries that we see is that the most important agenda setter will be the government. When the government acts, and legislates or mandates something to happen, everyone is forced to comply. In the absence of those standards, then you have this dichotomy between local brands and global brands. The global brands tend to work on a global agenda. Local brands are working on a local agenda. The minimal activity they're forced to do is about what they have to do to comply because consumers are starting to evolve and become more focused on sustainability but still not at a point that they're often willing to pay more for a, a product that, that helps towards that goal. That's why we need a toolkit of solutions because no one brand is operating to a common agenda. Everyone has a different variant in terms of what's important to them. And that's why we need a range of solutions to, to deal with that range of priorities. Another thing which is different in Asia as it relates to label recycling is this scrap economy 
that exists. So there's disorganized collection, this scrap economy of, uh, of people that collect, sort and sell scrap and typically running through a mechanical recycling process, uh, which ends up in a downcycling outcome. This is very common for the emerging Asia region, which is very different to the mature regions like Japan or Korea or even the US or Europe. So in this, society, in this uh, ecosystem, mechanical recycling is a primary platform. Sometimes in that mechanical recycling, there's even manual separation of the label from the container before it goes through that process. So this is one thing that we've uh, had to focus on in a stronger way in Asia than in other more mature regions. And one common thing I think everywhere around the world, but particularly in, in Asia, is there's no green premium. People will not pay more for a sustainability solution. Therefore, one of our big focuses has been on how do we make it at least cost neutral to a, to a segment, make it more of the standard product to make it more relevant for, for the, uh, each of the countries that we're playing within. And that's, that's one of the key themes you'll hear coming through the next couple of slides. Our sustainability portfolio is umbrellaed under what we call the sustainable advantage. It really is configured in four buckets. The first one, enabling recycling, reuse or compostability. And as it says there, what, what we use can be used again. The second one contains recycled or renewable content giving a second life to what's already been used. The third one, reduction in the use of materials. This has been uh, something that has been a focus in the last couple of years as we down gauge and uh, reduce where we can. And the last one there is responsibly sourced, which has been a longer focus on that, particularly around FSC for us. Most of our portfolio now has got FSC approval on the paper side. Reduction, we have a, a so-called think thin portfolio. There's, there's other benefits on, on reducing the caliper of what you're supplying as a label stock. Effectively, you get longer rolls and better productivity, better freight outcomes, but fundamentally it also reduces the amount of material that is consumed in, in providing a labeling solution. There's more focus coming in now on recycled or renewable content. One of the reasons for that is it's a connection the brand our end users can make with their consumers to make the, the claim that they're actually using recycled content or renewable content particularly when it comes to containers uh, that's been a big focus and for us on the label side we're also developing and have developed our portfolios to have a much higher proportion of recycled content in what we offer so in the paper category both on the face stock side, we have recycled content in our, in our semi-gloss paper. We also have recycled content in our glassine, our backing liners. In the wine category, which is a, a big focus on, on sustainability from a consumer connection standpoint, we actually have papers that go from 30% all the way up to 100% recycled content. More recently in films, we've actually introduced recycled content polyethylene labels, 30%. Just last year, we introduced our recycled content polypropylenes at again 30%. So in the film space, uh, we're, we're evolve, evolving that portfolio. On the, back on the backing side, that we have recycled content polyester liners as well, uh, which for, for beverage and for wine in particular uh, is very interesting. So there's 30% recycled content in that backing liner. And then in terms of e-commerce and uh, track and trace applications, direct thermal is, a, is the primary technology in that area. We now have uh, direct thermal labels, which have a 15% post-consumer waste content. So this portfolio continues to evolve. We wrestle with the supply and cost and performance uh, variances that come with recycled content, but effectively it's becoming much more of a mainstream offering for us now. Where I want to spend more time today is on enabling recycling, reuse and compostability. And I'm going to spend more time on plastic. We do have solutions that allow recycling of glass, whether it's actually a better colour recovery from a, uh, a wash off solution or reuse of the, of the bottle with a filmic solution that actually can detach from the glass through a washing process. We're expanding our portfolio of compostable labels but where most of our focus on today is going to be on um, labels on plastic containers 
I'm going to talk in a minute about our clean flake and monomaterials and our removable solutions for that category. The first one that's uh, it's been in the market for several years in other regions is what we call clean flake. What clean flake does is it's a switchable adhesive. It basically turns off when it uh, is activated by hot water and caustic solution. And the platform we've got as our mainstream solution in Asia is actually meeting the APR design guidelines for that. And it deactivates and detaches at 85 degrees Celsius with a 1% uh, caustic combination. It also means that the label carries the ink away from the bottle and floats to the top in the process, leaving clean polyester flakes to continue through the process. And that means at the end of that process, they can use those polyester flakes for food grade, bottle to bottle applications. This is the high standard in terms of circularity outcomes in the packaging space as it relates to labels. We have also made several changes uh, on this area. We've actually localized the supply chain of that product so we can source the components and produce the product in local production plants we have across India, ASEAN, Korea, and China, which means we actually have quick availability and very market relevant pricing on those products as it relates to our standard portfolio. So the difference between the, uh, the clean flake offer and the standard offer or the legacy product we sold is, is very close now um, within 5% at the level we sell to our customers. So by the time it goes to an end user, uh, a brand, that is a very small, small difference in price. This product can be used not only on polyester bottles, but also polyester trays and thermoforms. So it's uh, applicable across multiple packaging platforms. We also have variations which we uh, have designed that can work at lower temperatures, 80 degrees Celsius and 75 degrees Celsius. So we have a, a roadmap of options, which means as recycling processes become tighter in the future, we have solutions that can meet those, uh, those more difficult kind of thresholds. Second one I want to talk about today is a little newer for us is mono materials. We find that on HDPE in particular, there's not a, an opportunity to achieve what we achieve on polyester bottles, which I just covered with clean flakes. So where we're focused on now is actually making sure we actually enable a mono material outcome. And our portfolio is our polyolefin films now, which is polypropylene, polyethylene, and our polyolefins now have all been approved to meet the APR standard for critical guidance on HDPE recycling. This allows uh, the outcome that there's no, no impact on the physical properties of HDPE pellets, which means it can be reused back into the stream for pigmented applications. An important point to make is that that approval we've received is actually on the unprinted label stock. There is a second step that has to be taken by the label converter where they have to get that same approval but on the printed label and we can help guide our customers our converters on how to achieve that but effectively you can get a a certification from apr that the printed label when using our materials can meet that threshold uh, for critical guidance allowing for recycling of the uh, hdpe pellets and that can go back into a bottle or easily downcycled, but it, the main point is it can go back into a bottle, it's potential because it's not changing the characteristics of those pellets. Uh, we also offer these products on recycled content, um, face stocks and liners. Not only rigid plastics, but on flexibles, we also have the chance to offer a mono material outcome. The last one is a, is a new idea from us and it's, uh, we're calling it clean, it's a clean pill outcome. It's a label that can be removed by the consumer. And in, uh, in some countries like Japan, there is an expectation that the consumer will re remove the, the label from the container before they dispatch of it in the, in the trash can. Typically, you see this in shrink sleeve where they have a perforation. So the uh, consumer is encouraged to use the perforation to separate the sleeve and then put them into the trash separately. With clean peel, these are removable uh, products. The consumer can also remove the self-adhesive label from the container. Now, the label itself is a permanent label, but 
it is possible with a filmic face stock that you can peel that away from the container in a clean way and separate the label from the container and dispatch of it in the same way you would do with a shrink sleeve. Um, so this is just an idea we've got about allowing our brands to reinforce that consumer education across multiple label technologies. In Asia, as I mentioned, in the uh, recycling process, it's often common that the label is manually removed. So this is hitting on two things. One is the consumer and their ability to remove the label. On the other side, it's about uh, in, the, in the recycling process, the manual removal of the label, which allows for a clean yield as well. Transparency is also a big priority for us. Um, historically, what we've used is a life cycle assessment tool that cuts across six categories. And you can see here the example we've uh, compared uh, a 40 micron product on clean flake adhesive with a recycled polyester liner with a, a standard product in our range on 50 micron polypropylene. And the impact, if you go left to right, you can see that the reduction in oil, 30%, water, 22 and electricity by 25, greenhouse gas 28, and solid waste by 24, and it rises to 55% reduction in solid waste if you recycle the liner. But we're evolving that focus now to look at uh, two things in a much bigger way, carbon footprint and water usage. The, the need to be carbon neutral and the focus on being able to measure that is such that we're actually re refreshing our assessment tool, and we'll be bringing that out towards the end of this year. I want to move to the last part of my presentation today, which is just talking about matrix and liner waste. The matrix is a byproduct of uh, producing a self adhesive label. And you can see that top left hand corner, that's what a printer would uh, be creating as they produce the label. It's effectively taking away the unused face stock that isn't printed on, and that's what we call matrix. On the other side of the slide, you can see effectively a schematic talking about the liner. Once the label is applied to the container, the glassine backing liner is separated away and collected by our brand owners or end users. And these are two, in the big scheme of things, relatively small pieces of the uh, sustainability ecosystem, but for us, they're a primary responsibility that we need to address. And we've got two paths to achieving that. The first one is we've, we've recently rebranded this as AD Circular. This is effectively, our recycling programs that are made available to recycle matrix, which comes from the printers, or liners, which are collected by the end users, our customers' customers. And we've scaled that up across the Asia Pacific region for both uh, paper and polyester liner in China, as well as, as matrix. And you see that in other regions like ASEAN, India, and Australia, New Zealand, various versions of that which we're continually evolving. One of the challenges that uh, we're, we're wrestling with is the need to have a local solution for the recycling outcome in countries that are, are small like Singapore. You need to find a home for something which there may not be a home for. But overall, we're expanding this program uh, and there's more to come in this area. The other area that we're working together with is in an industry a consortium approach. Initially in North America and Europe, this entity called C-Lab was established. And this, this industry consortium is made up of both our suppliers as well as our competitors acting as an industry body to deal with both matrix and liner and achieving circular outcomes for both of those. And we're looking to scale that up and activate that into Asia, initially in China and Japan being the first line of thought. And again, the goal for this uh, C-Lab organisation, for me at least, is we believe that technically it's possible to recycle paper-based glassine liner in the same way any other primary paper is recycled, meaning you can put it through the general waste stream uh, and achieve a circular outcome. That's a technical discussion that we need to have with recyclers in each country. It's an industry body challenge, and that's one that we're going to activate together with our other industry partners uh, towards the end of this year. And with that, I conclude my presentation and I'm open for questions. Thank you.